Yes. Okay. I'm past his line. Yet. Welcome. <laughs> I am Dr. Michelle Cooley and welcome to It's Your Life with Dr. James Cooley. And he will be joining us in a minute, but we are thankful. We welcome you to this brand new show. And we have one of our honorary, frequent, amazing guests on the show. Um, Paula Shaw. I mean, there's so many stories Dr. Cooley can tell about her, but she is an amazing, an amazing, amazing guest. And we are just so excited to have her on the show today. Hi, Paula. Hello, Michelle. I'm delighted to be back with you again. I feel like you and JC are family. Oh, gosh, you you are like family. And you know what? I, I don't think I've told you this, but you have the most beautiful smile. You got these rosy cheeks and you're always so happy and so happy. And, you know, you bring a lot of light to our show. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. That's because I feel so good when I'm here. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I can't believe it. I actually went to bed almost one o'clock last, last well, this morning, morning as we're doing a Super Bowl party. 
<laughs> and um, uh, you know, cleaning up. It wasn't that crazy, but I know you um, you hosted a Super Bowl at party as well. I did. I did. My parents are, you know, I guess we should tell everybody that our beloved Jason is having some technical difficulties, <laughs> as I think they can probably see him. But uh, my parents are 93, my mom's 93, my dad's 97. And I just got to thinking about them just kind of sitting alone. Though They would have turned on the Super Bowl, of course, but there wouldn't have been any special snacks or any special anything really going on. And I said, what if I pick up some treats and food and I bring the party to you? And so that's what I did. And since we were rooting for Kansas City, my daughter and her boyfriend picked up barbecue. And we just had a great time watching an incredible game, right? Oh, my gosh. The game was so close. I couldn't watch the last four minutes because I was oh. I was rooting for Kansas City. I couldn't watch the last. But I was I was happy about the outcome. Yes, it was a nail biter at the end. That's for sure. Absolutely. But, you know, I'm, I was happy, even though it's a killer when you're for the team that loses by the field goal. But at least everybody could go home going, hey, we did our best. We showed up. And, you know, that's such a great metaphor for life, isn't it? Because not every day goes great. I mean, right now, our beloved host is having some problems with his computer. But the bottom line is, if you can say I showed up and I did the best I could, that's about as good as it is. Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. So we want to um, talk about this amazing show today. And it's called Beyond the Grief. And I know we talked a little bit about it and something you wanted to um, to just you know discuss with the audience a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So audience, if you want to be part of this conversation, please go on to whatever social media platform you're on and just type in your comments, whether you have a question for Paula Shaw or, uh, you know, uh, just a comment period. So let's, let's get started. So uh, again, the title of the show is Beyond the Grief, and we're getting to know life transitions coach and grief specialist, best-selling author, keynote speaker, media host, Paula Shaw. And we're going to talk about like right now, the epic proportions of grief globally and mm -hmm. why grief is the most misunderstood human experience that every human will experience mm -hmm. and why most people have no idea how to talk to and help a griever. So let's just refresh and just remind everyone about our amazing guest, Paula Shaw. Life tra Transitions Coach, Grief Specialist, Best-Selling Author, Keynote Speaker, Media Host on Home Show and Changing Up Radio with Paula Shaw. More than 25 years, she's been dedicated to helping people navigate the stress of change and challenge using mind, body, tools, and techniques. She's a founding member of the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology. She has degrees in education and communications, as well as graduate counseling credentials in grief and addictive disorders. She's the author of several books, including Chakras, The Magnificent Seven, Grief, When Will This Pain Ever End? And our latest book, Saying the Right Thing When You Don't Know What to Say. We welcome again Paula Shaw to the show. Yay! Thank you. Yes. So, wow. So, Paula, let's, let's just get to it. So, you know, you have been such a, a recent, you've been a frequent guest on our show. You're like an honorary member. <laughs> so, you know, there's always a beginning story. Can you tell us why you became a life transitions coach and a grief specialist? Yeah, I will. And I also want to say, Michelle, I feel a little bit like today is my coming out party um, because I originally, my original training was as an um, a alcohol and drug addictions counselor. And then I did specialty training in grief because it occurred to me that most people who are dealing with addiction are trying to cope with the pain they have from some unhealed loss. And any loss experience creates grief. So once I got into grief work, I realized there were, it's so universal. There's so much pain out there. There's so much grief. And one of the reasons people don't realize it is because, well, let me ask you, when I say the word grief, what pictures come into your head? 
When you say the word grief, I think of crying and tears and sadness and yeah. emptiness. That's what I think of. Yes, perfect. Wearing black, being at a funeral, right? Because most people associate grief with death. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that the grief is the normal, natural response to loss. And isn't it a loss when you're hoping you're going to get picked for homecoming queen and you don't? If you're dying for, I mean, I'm using small examples here, but you're a little kid dying for a bicycle for Christmas and you don't get it. Mm -hmm. If you go to the doctor and he tells you you have cancer, if your beloved on Valentine's Day, instead of giving you flowers and candy, tells you that he's breaking up with you or she's breaking up with you. Those are all loss experiences. And your response to those experiences could be anything from crying and screaming and stomping your feet to going into despondence and depression and disconnection. So we normally associate tears with grief, but you know what? If a teenager who got shamed at school yesterday uh, and many days, maybe because of their gender preference or because of some other thing where they're not like everybody thinks they should be, Mm -hmm. That might show up as anxiety or it might show up as depression. It might show up as an inability to focus on their studies. But every one of those things I just described is one of the faces of grief. Wow. Grief has many faces. And that's why I call it the most misunderstood emotion because everybody thinks it's tears and sadness, but not always. For some people, it shows up as what we would call hypochondriacism. I think that's the word, but you know, being a hypochondriac where you're just constantly ill because that feels like the only way you can get love and attention or feel like, you know, you, somebody's nurturing you. So wow. there are many, many faces of grief and, and I think what made me decide to become a life transition coach and now to be taking my own show, Change It Up Radio, into a season that I'm going to call Beyond Grief is because I feel a little bit like I've been an undercover agent. I have been a grief expert, but many years ago, someone said to me, everyone hates the word grief and nobody wants to be a griever. So I've been using other words instead, like transition. Loss is, is actually a good word, but I've been using other words. And the truth is, you know what? People are really finally ready to talk about grief and relate to the word grief because we're just more honest about it now. And so I want to be more honest too and start talking about it and calling it what it is. It is a life transition, but it's also known as grief. You know what? Uh, can, you, can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah. we can hear you we great. Can. Welcome. <laughs> hey, I don't I don't know what was wrong over here, you know, but uh You were experiencing okay. a little grief yourself, weren't you? <laughs> uh, a lot of a lot of grief. <laughs> How you doing, Paula? How you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Your lovely wife and I have been having a wonderful chat while your technical difficulties got solved. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm up in uh, California now, so mm -hmm. and, um, in, but the setup is a little bit different, but uh, the results are going to be the same. So, so Paula, what have you learned about yourself uh, and your profession that that you did not realize before? Oh, wow. That's a huge question, JC. Um, you know what? I think what, what pops into my head is the word authenticity. Because as I was saying to Michelle, there was a, there was a period here for quite some time that I've been trying to find something to call myself or something to call my work that did not involve the word grief. 
because I was under the impression that nobody wanted to talk about grief. And then, you know what? I got inspired by Anderson Cooper, who created a podcast in last fall called All There Is, and it was all about his loss and grief experiences. And the guests he had on were talking about their loss and grief experiences. And guess what, JC? In two weeks, he had 2 million listeners. And I went, wow, somebody out there needs this topic. People do want to talk about grief and hear about grief and get help with what to do with their grief because it's scary. It's a big, huge set of emotions. And most of us have no idea what to do with it. Oh, yeah. So you came up with this title, uh, Beyond Grief. Mm -hmm. um, what what would you think when you came up with that one? And I know you said that uh, that's going to be the title of your new show yeah. that's coming up. It's going to be the title of this season. We're still going to be Change It Up Radio because it fits that genre. But each season, I like to theme the shows around something. And so, yeah, this season, I'm coming out as an actual grief specialist, which I am. And I am I think really what, what made me want to talk about Beyond Grief is one of the things, and I mean this in no way to be judging Anderson Cooper's show because I love it and have listened to it multiple times. But he's he's a journalist. He's not a grief expert. And so sometimes when people say like, I didn't know what to do about that or I don't know what to do about that, there's a part of me that goes, I do. I can <laughs> help. You know, but Anderson very honestly says, yeah, I know what you mean. You know, I, I don't really know what to do either. And so there was this part of me that just went, wow, I need to start talking about this because when we're grieving, we're like cast adrift on a piece of large wood in the ocean and it's all overwhelming and we don't know what to do. And so I have been over 28 years now working with grieving people. I have some ideas about what to do. They're not perfect and it's not the be all and end all because let me be very clear, there is no one right way to grieve. It is individual and unique for every one of us. And so I want to give everybody permission to do it whatever way comes naturally to them. But I've got some ideas about what can be helpful and what can help you heal. Why don't you hold those ideas until we take this break? We're gonna take okay. a quick break, but we're gonna come back and you know, just like Paul is, she knows she's one of my favorites. We're gonna come <laughs> back and talk more and more about grief. It's your life. I'm Dr. James J.C. Cooley. See you shortly after the break. Hello, hey, I'm James Cooley. I am the founder and CEO of the J.C. Cooley Foundation, Options Opportunity Slash the Choice Program. Our primary mission is to help build the foundation of our youth and young adults and communities. And we encourage everyone to dream big, think big, and be big at everything you do. And the way that you do that is, first of all, you got to believe in yourself. You have to believe in yourself. You have to know that you are here for a purpose. You also have to be able to step out your comfort zone and do things that you that you probably didn't think that you can do.
Hello, welcome back to the James Cooley Show. It's your life. Uh, just like I said, I got one of my favorites, uh, Paula Shaw, and I just uh, love her coming on the show, educating us and entertaining us and lifting <laughs> us up, especially when we're grieving or have experienced a grief. Uh, grief is inevitable. It's, it's going to happen. It's just how you deal with it. You know, so if you want to be part of this conversation, all you do is go to the comments, ask Paula any question that you like, and I promise you we'll get you an answer. Hey, Paula, so what is the definition of grief? Well, grief, that definition is something I mentioned when we were talking a bit ago. Grief is the normal, natural response to loss. And that loss might be a person, a place a thing, a situation, you know, like let's say you belong to a country club and you really like it and they somehow decide they don't want you as a member anymore. That's a situation you loved and now you've lost it. So there could very well be a grief response to something like that. If you're going to a certain university or you live in a certain city and now you have to move for work, or something of that nature, that could be a loss. So you see, it's that as Michelle and I were discussing, most folks think grief is has to do with death. But it no, the important word is lost. So the loss of a person, place, thing, circumstance, or state of being, or any of those losses is going to produce grief. Wow. You know, Paula, we, um, you know, like you said, there's so many different types of grief. So I remember this friend of mine, uh, we were talking, this is a long time ago, and a girlfriend of hers, um, a relationship just ended, and the mm -hmm. girlfriend was grieving for it. And she said she gave her friend this advice. She's like, you know, she should be rejoicing because the person was no good. But the mm -hmm. thing about grief is, even though the I, I, outs, a person on the outside may think this is the best thing because this issue, whether it's an end of a marriage, relationship, or whatever, is the best thing for the person, you still need to let that person grieve in their own way. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely spot on, Michelle. And, and I'll tell you, you bring up such a great point, and I talk about this a lot on Change It Up Radio. Humans have a love-hate relationship with change. Like what you were just saying, maybe the relationship wasn't working anyway, and that person might have been very miserable in the relationship. But we love the familiar, and we hate the discomfort of the unfamiliar. And grief thrusts us into the unfamiliar, whether it's because somebody died or we have to change locations, or our health is different, or the relationship ended. Now we're suddenly awash in this sea of discomfort with the unfamiliar. And that discomfort shows up in many ways. It might show up in just hysterical crying. It might show up in feeling unfocused and, and just not grounded. It might show up in anxiety or fear. So it shows up in a lot of different ways. But, you know, we all have known people who stay in bad situations too long because they're afraid of the discomfort of the change. And that's basically what your friend was talking about. But you're right. We have to allow everyone to grieve each situation in their own unique way. Because how you grieve is a is sort of this um, conglomerate of everything you've experienced in your life, what your family taught you, what your church taught you, all these different pieces come to play in how you grieve. What's the difference between grieving and mourning? Oh, wow. That's a really cool question, JC. Um, well, I would think of it this way, and this is just a Paula definition. I don't know if there's an actual Wikipedia or a dictionary definition, but the way I think of it is they're very similar in many ways. It feels to me like mourning is more 
the first thing that comes up, the, the just the wailing, the why God moments, the how could this be moments, you know, that is just mourning. It's like, no, 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 there's no reason to go on. That kind of feeling feels to me like mourning. Grieving is kind of a bigger compendium of emotions because like I've been saying, it can embrace a lot of different emotions, and it can last a while. There are people who've been grieving for years, and that's one of the reasons I feel my work is important, because I've heard people say, once you lose a child, you'll never be the same. Once you have this happen, your life is ruined. You know, I've heard people say this, they believe it, and I think the reason they say it is because they don't know any different because they didn't get the help they needed when they were in that situation. And then you you become a monument to despair. If you don't heal your grief, then you just stay stuck in it and you become a monument to despair. And that's just so sad. So sad. In fact, I just saw this last weekend, this movie out called The Whale. I don't know if you've seen it. But the bottom line of the story is this man didn't get the help he needed to grieve something really huge in his life. And then he just kept eating to sidetrack himself from his despair, to cope with his despair. And he literally turned into this hugely obese person who was like a classic embodiment of a monument to despair. Wow. You know, so you mentioned uh, that grief is misunderstood emotions. Why is that? I think uh, what I said is it's the most misunderstood emotion. And that's for the reasons that we've been discussing, because most folks think it's just tears. Most folks think it's just being despondent. But I think people are surprised to learn that for, let me give you an example from my own practice. Last year, I was working with a teenage gal who had been going to school on the computer during the pandemic and was depressed and despondent because of the loss of being on campus with her friends and having the usual school experience. But then when they said, it's time to go back to school and be on campus, she got very anxious and scared because suddenly now it was the, the peer stuff and the competition and all that. All those things she was feeling were grief, right? In the first place, she, was, she had lost the school experience, so she was depressed. But now she was going to lose the safety of being home on her computer and have to go back on campus and compete. So she became anxious. Both aspects of grief and most folks wouldn't think of those things as grief. Wow. You know, you have said that uh, dealing with grief is global. I mean, you mean epics. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain why? Well, I mean, this planet right now has got grief going on in every corner. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's the horrific things happening in Ukraine or uh, the, the injustices in Iran or, you know, there's so many things going on here in our own country. We're having difficulties just, you know, getting along with each other and trying to go forward as Americans rather than this bipartisan view that has developed. And I think if we remember what we've been talking about, grief is any kind of, of a loss of a person, a place, a thing, a circumstance. And so I think many of us have lost the circumstance of believing we all stand together and we're Americans and we're the best country in the world and all the stuff that since I was a kid, everybody's been saying. And suddenly many things have changed. People in the Ukraine don't wake up in the morning without fear. You know, that whole situation that two years ago they lived in is gone. And and so I remember a play I saw, and I wish I could think of the name, but there was a soliloquy in the play where the woman was saying, there was a time 
when all we had to concern ourselves with was what was going on in our own little village. But now we wake up and on our shoulders is the pain of all these different peoples in the world and of women and, and of gender uh, people who are people who are dealing with their gender issues. There are all these different places where there's pain that's being brought to us on the news and the internet every day. And humans weren't designed to deal with that much pain and grief on a daily basis. You know, big difference from worrying about what's happening to, to um, shelters down in your village, you know, or two tenths down if you were Native Americans from the whole world and the political arena and the health, possible health crisis, or what about when we were in the middle of a pandemic? You know, we've had to deal with a lot. Wow. You know, we have to a station break, but we're going to come back. We're going to pick this up again. We're going to get some recommendations on what happens when somebody first gives you the news of a law one. So when we come back, I'm going to bring that question up. If you want to be part of this conversation, all you do is go to the comments. Ask uh, Paul any question you like. It's your life. I'm Dr. James J.C. Cool to see you shortly. <music> Welcome back to the James Cooley Show. It's your life. And as you know, my uh, one of my favorite guests, Paula Shaw, is always bringing it to us and I mean, educating us like she always, you know. So if you have any questions for her, just go to the comments and just ask any questions and we'll get you an answer. Hey, Paula, mm -hmm. when, um, when someone get the news uh, of a loss that they just suffered, what would be the first thing? would you recommend them to do? Mm, I love that question. So this gives me an opportunity to say one of my favorite things that I want the world to know. And that is, there are no five stages of grief. This is a misunderstanding from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's work on the five stages of death and dying. So those five stages, um, denial, anger, bargaining, you know, all of those things that come up in the five stages are what happen when a person is dying. Those are not the five stages 
experienced by the people left behind, the grievers. So remember, grief can happen in dimensions. So for example, the question that you just asked, James, one of the first dimensions a person might experience is shock, denial, um, you know, feeling frozen, being paralyzed, being, you know, blown away, as we would say, and, and not even knowing what to do. Sometimes people are just numb, you know, they're just paralyzed with the shock of it all. Sometimes people pass out. Sometimes people throw up. But what I want to say is whatever that initial intense feeling is, and it will be intense for you, that's what's right for you. You know, there is no book of etiquette of the proper way to grieve. And no matter what anybody ever says to you, don't ever buy into that. Because whatever is true and authentic for you is the proper way for you to grieve. You know, I might add to that, JC. Uh, right now, I happen to be working with several widows. And one widow's response to her husband's death was, there's no reason to go on. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. There's no reason to go on. Another widow's response was, oh, my God, I'm so overwhelmed with everything there is to do, all the paperwork, all of this, all of that. I can't do it. I can't do it. This powerless, helpless feeling. Another one was ticked off, really pissed, really upset that this happened and angry at God. And then, and then people feel badly because they've had this very natural reaction of feeling angry at God because we're always taught God's running the show. And when something bad happens to us, who are we going to blame? <laughs> you know, we're naturally going to be upset with the person in charge or the being in charge. So each response different though, each one coming from what's authentic for them and what gets triggered in them. For some women, it's, I don't, or, or any person who loses a loved one, I don't want to be alone. How will I cope alone? How can I survive by myself? For others, it's, but now I've got to take care of the children and figure everything out by myself. Others, it might be financial fear. So that's what I guess I'm making, I hope I'm making this point. This is a many faceted experience. There's no one way that everybody's going to go through. And that's why I hate this five stages misunderstanding that's so huge out there. Because then people come to me and they go, I can't get angry. I don't know how I'll ever heal from my, my grief because I can't get through the anger stage. I don't feel anger. And people think if they don't go through all five stages, they'll never get to the other side. And that's not true. Uh, Michelle, you, uh, you, you're on mute. <laughs> Paula, I'm, I'm, I'm not muted now. <laughs> um, I've read stories and I'm sure you've heard people say, um, I say this, like while they're grieving, some of, is it possible that people, some people don't want to stop grieving because either they have to face the reality mm -hmm. of the loss, number one, or that they're afraid or they're worried what other people are going to think if they stop the grieving process and start living again. Mm -hmm. A perfect example of someone say they lost their spouse and eight months later, you know, they, you know, God is great. And he, and he puts someone else in their life. Yeah. And, they want to start living again and maybe just forming a relationship with this new person mm -hmm. is that it's maybe some issues where the griever may feel, what are people going to think that I didn't grieve long enough? I didn't love this person long enough. So it's just so many different emotions. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you bring up some great points <clears throat> and sometimes it's not even conscious because somehow there's this subconscious idea, and it, and it may be somewhat conscious, that as long as I'm crying and grieving and focusing on the loved one I've lost, my loyalty 
to that person and to that relationship is real and apparent. But if I suddenly find joy somewhere else and I'm back to being alive again, then there is a fear from some people on some people's part that they'll be judged for that, that it won't have been long enough that they were grieving or, or that they just feel in, in the, within themselves, they don't want that loved one to feel on any level that they don't still love them. But the truth is, at least in my belief system, once people leave this planet and they're of this high vibration, you know, and they can know and see much more than you can when you're down here on planet Earth, what they probably want more than anything is for us to be happy and to be alive again. You know, I mean, we came to the planet to live. We got put in a body to use it, to live, to feel, to run, to jump, to, to laugh, you know, to have physical relationships with people. And, and if we don't do that, we're not honoring what we came here to do. And I don't think anybody who moves on to a higher level would want us to stay stuck in some minimal existence to prove our loyalty. That doesn't even make sense. I definitely get that. I mean, we've known people who've lost loved ones and they found joy again mm -hmm. with a new relationship or new marriage. They're happy and everything like that. You know, that person is always in your heart, but God gave us a big heart to love, yes. to still love, to yeah. still love, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, gr grief is a very tricky thing. So as far as the person who's listening to the griever, is it, is it important to just listen? But when does it get to the point where it it's, the, the, the person who's listening may feel this is too much for me, even though it's not about them. Mm -hmm. But when do you kind of not separate, but just say, OK, maybe I need to leave this person alone just for a little bit? Well, I love this question, Michelle, because, you know, the reason I wrote this book, saying the right thing when you don't know what to say is because this is such a tricky situation for people. Everybody needs, particularly people who are grieving and or sad, they need someone to talk to. They need, one of the ways we heal is by expressing our thoughts, our feelings, our sadness, our fears, whatever we're experiencing. But most people feel very uncomfortable with that kind of a conversation because they're not sure what to say. They don't want to make it worse. And they know this person's already hurting. They certainly, you know, want, want to help, but they may not really understand how to help. So in this book, I talk about five steps that can really help you create a supportive, comforting, healing conversation. And the first step is have the right intention when you come into the conversation. And that intention should just be to be there, to just be there. Don't have a big plan about what you're going to teach them or how you're going to say to them. Just be present. And that's the second step, really. Be present. Don't be planning the grocery list or thinking about what you're doing tonight or any of that. The third step is just come from the mindset of being comforting and supporting. Don't be there to teach, to preach, or uh, tell them what to do. Just comfort and support. The fourth step is exactly what you were just talking about, Michelle. Listen. Oh, my God, the listening piece is so important. And when you're truly present and listening, there's an energy that's palpable. There's an energy that creates a safety for the grieving person. So now they can really open their heart and talk about the things that matter. And the final step is that when it is appropriate for you to speak, you as the person who's trying to be helpful, 
keep your response short because remember it's not about you the more you've got the hurting person talking the better off things are keep your response short and do not respond from the head respond from the heart what i like to say to people is when people are hurting they need your humanity not your database so come from your heart and if you've ever felt that feeling yourself go there then they're going to feel connected and safe wow that's uh those five steps are, are so helpful uh in you know understanding grief but you know we're going to take a station break but we're going to come back and we're going to talk about this a little bit more so i tell you if you want to be part of the conversation go to the comments Ask Paul any question you like. It's your life. I'm Dr. James J.C. Cooley. We'll be back shortly after the break. Dingley here, producer of The James Cooley Show, It's Your Life. And the new audio version of James' book, Country Boy, City Boy, A Journey That Ain't Over Yet, is a must-have. James shares his true life story of struggle and success in America. It's both a cautionary tale and a roadmap to achieving the American dream. Get the new audio version of Country Boy, City Boy, A Journey That Ain't Over Yet, by James Cooley on Amazon.com or wherever audiobooks are sold. Welcome back to the James Cooley Show. And, you know, Paula, just like always, you, you, you come with a wealth of knowledge. And today we're talking about grief, beyond grief. You know, so, hey, Paula, so you talked about five steps of a supported conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, how do we know how to grieve appropriately and then move on? Mm, wow. That's a really interesting question, JC, because I think a lot of what I'm going to call grief abuse happens because people have different ideas about what is grieving appropriately and when you should move on. Let's start with, do you remember the days when you got three days off work to grieve? <laughs> Three days if you lost your mom, your dad, no, you know, whatever. And I don't think there's anybody in the history of the world who's ever been done with grief in three days if it was any kind of significant loss. And so, again, you know, the point I want to keep driving home is there is no one size fits all. There is no one right way. There is no grief etiquette. Each person... Is, is this myriad of different experiences, different teachers, different parents, different friends, different siblings, and all those pieces come together in who we are as the griever. And so we're, we're triggered in different ways. We express in different ways. You know, one of the things that I talk about in this book, saying the right thing when you don't know what to say is, one of the reasons it can be very difficult to help a friend who's grieving is because of the very things I've been discussing. For example, if you grew up in a home that was 
kind of a very stiff upper lip kind of environment, you know, where you just bury your pain and you put on an I'm fine face and you just go out and do what has to be done. If you have a friend who comes from a very demonstrative kind of upbringing where you just cry and you tell everybody what's going on with you, it's hard to support that person because of the values that you grew up with versus the values they grew up with. And this is one of the problems. You know, we have to accept each other for who we are because who we are is going to determine how we grieve. And if we don't have the acceptance, how can we support that person the way they need to be supported? I like what you said about the time when you get three days to grieve or you're off from work. And you're yeah. right. Who, who can do that in three days? It's kind of mm -hmm. robotic. But I remember this story, one of my coworkers told me, she lost a mother a long, long time ago. She came back to work because sometimes people need to be kept busy. It, mm -hmm. To each, you know, everyone's different. And I guess she wasn't ready to go back to work because someone said the wrong thing to her and she started throwing things at them in the office, mm -hmm. you know, and it was just her way of just, uh, but I think they sent her home to maybe, you know, take a couple of weeks off because sometimes you, you really need that. Or sometimes you need to get away from family, you know, from your family dynamic. So mm -hmm. um, it, yeah. it really depends, but you know, you mentioned the book that you wrote about, um, you know, you don't know what to say. What, what, say that book again, Paula. Hold that book up. It's saying the right thing when you don't know what to say. Oh. And the, the one that came before that was this one, grief. Whoops, let's see. Mm -hmm. When will this pain ever end? And they kind of work together in that one gives you processes and tools and articles mm -hmm. that are helpful with how to go through the grief journey. And the other one is both helpful for the, the griever and for the person who's trying to support the griever. Because as I said, most people don't feel competent to support someone who's hurting. And, and a lot of times, Michelle, what happens is the person who's hurting has these things said to them that are not helpful at all. One of the things I do in this book that I love this one is I make a list. It's funny to know the right angle. I make a list of 20 things that are helpful to say and 20 things that are not helpful to say and 20 things. If you're the grieving person that you can say in response, when people say something to you, like, well, I guess God needed him more than you did. Oh, or, He's in a better place now. Or, you know, those things people say, they're trying to be helpful. <laughs> they just sometimes make you angry if you're the grieving person, you know, or, or they just, they make you feel worse. And especially because they're uncomfortable too. Like oh, say, oh, well, you know, they're out of their misery now. It's, it's like, I don't want to hear that. You no, know, no. nobody you wants know to hear that. That's a perfect example, Michelle, of a piece of intellectual information mm -hmm. rather than heart information. Yes, they may be out of their misery now, but that doesn't help me when I'm miserable that they're gone. And that's what I'm talking about when I said in that fifth step, mm -hmm. respond from the heart. You know, like even if you just say, I don't know what to say. I feel so badly for you. I can't imagine how painful this is. There was no magical, perfect answer in that, was there? But I was connecting as human to human with those statements. And sometimes that's the best thing we can do. Or just shut up and give them a hug. That can be one of the best things you can do. So Paula, those two books you wrote about grief, do you plan on writing any more books in the future? Like what is that, what are your projects coming up that you can share with the audience? Well, that's a wonderful question. I'm actually, I really want to um, do a revised version of this one, saying the right thing when you don't know what to say, mm -hmm. because there are some pieces I've discovered in doing corporate presentations and presenting to different groups, some pieces I'd like to enlarge upon. Mm -hmm. And because this feels like such a universal problem. Mm 
Because on the one hand, you have the griever saying to me as their counselor, mm -hmm. nobody came, nobody called, nobody even talked about it when I went back to the office. So they're feeling like they're not supported or cared about. And then you have the people on the other side going, I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to make it worse. You know, like you said earlier, Michelle, when we were talking, I didn't want to discuss it and feel bad. And, and yet it's the elephant in the middle of the living room, right? If someone just lost their husband and they come back to work, she's very aware that she lost her husband. Mm -hmm. But everybody at the office might go, well, don't bring it up. We don't want to get her upset. She is upset. She's very aware her whole world is turned upside down. So it's better to just say, you know, I don't know what to say, or I just want you to know you're in my heart or my thoughts are with you or some mm -hmm. little spoken word of support that helps them know that you're at least aware. And then they have, that gives them permission to talk about it with you if they want to. You know what I found out, and I'll give this to Dr. Cooley, that even though let's say you've might have been experienced, you might have been experiencing or you've experienced the same thing that person who's now grieving is, mm -hmm. still don't make it about you. Right. You know, when the time comes and you you want to share your story, do you agree that that time will come? But it's not about you right now. It's about the person who's totally. grieving. Mm -hmm. That was one of the points I made. Keep your uh, entry into the conversation brief. But to say something like, and you don't want to say, I know how you feel. Never, ever, ever say, I know how you feel, even if you've experienced the same thing, because mm -hmm. you don't know how they feel. But you can say, I can't imagine what you're feeling, but I have experienced something similar and I know it was hell. I know it was so hard. So I get it. See, that's not saying I know how you feel, but it's letting them know that we're connecting, that I'm there, that I get it. And, and that's some of the things we talk about in this little book. Wow. We're down to the last minute of the show, Paula. How can uh, folks get in touch with you? And also, how can they uh, get your books? Um, the books are all on Amazon. And probably the easiest thing would be just search Paula Shaw. And all three books are there. Uh, they can go to polishaw.com and there's information there how to get a complimentary 20 minute consult with me, uh, information about my books, about my speaking uh, topics that I talk on and just basically how to get in touch with me. Well, Paula, it's always an absolute pleasure having you on the show. So thank you so much. I'd like mm -hmm. to thank uh, the executive thank producer and co-host Michelle Cooley for putting together another fantastic show. Most importantly, I'd like to thank our viewers and our listeners for taking the time to listen to the James Cooley Show every day. Remember, dream big, think big, and be big at everything you do. We'll see you tomorrow, same time, same place. Mm -hmm. It's your life.